we're at a point now where we're prepared to say something very important and exciting about the subgroups of finite groups. It's a theorem that's probably more important than almost any other theorem in the theory of finite groups, called Lagrange's theorem. So the goal of this next set of videos is to get us to Lagrange's theorem. How do we understand why it is that it's true using a tool that we call cosets? We've begun to think about cosets a little bit in our last set of videos. We want to think about them some more here and see how it is that they play a central ro role in discovering this really important theorem. So I'll tell you what the theorem says in a second, um, but the goal of it is to say something about the orders of subgroups in a finite group. So we know a little something about the answer to this question. We know, for example, that when a group is a finite and cyclic group, we had a series of results several chapters ago that said that the orders of all the elements in those groups and the orders of all the subgroups of those groups divide the order of the group. So if I have a finite cyclic group of order 16, then I know that every element in that group is going to have order 1, 2, 4, 8, or 16, and every subgroup of that group is going to have order 1, 2, 4, 8, or 16. If I have a group of order 12 that's cyclic, for example, then we know that that group is actually isomorphic to Z12, the additive group of integers mod 12. If I pick up an element in that group, like the element 3, and if I pick up the subgroup that that element generates, the subgroup generated by 3, 0, 3, 6, and 9, mod 12, that those elements and subgroups actually have order 4. The subgroup has order 4 because it's got 4 elements in it, 0, 3, 6, and 9. And the question is, why is it reasonable in this cyclic group that the order of the subgroup divide the order of the big group? Well, let's just look at how we can take this group H, this subgroup, and think about how all the other elements in my group are related to H. So if I start with 0, 3, 6, and 9, how do I fill in the rest of this table? Well, one systematic way to do it is just to add 1 and then add 2 to each of the elements in H. So that now I'm listing all of the elements in Z mod 12 kind of down the column and then across the row. 0, 1, 2, 3, which is an H again, 4, 5, 6, which is an H, 7, 8, 9, which is an H, 10, 11. So what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to start thinking about the other rows on this table. This H row, that's actually a subgroup of G. But this next row is not a subgroup. We can tell that it's not a subgroup because, for example, it doesn't contain the identity element of the group G, which is 0. And yet, it's still an interesting enough structure that we want to study it in its own right. Instead of calling it H, we could call it 1 plus H. After all, it is, element-wise, exactly the same thing as adding 1 to each of the elements of the set H. Happen to be a subgroup. Same thing with our last row. We could call it 2 plus H. So where the purple row H here is a subgroup of G, the blue row and the green row are not subgroups, but they're so closely related to the subgroup H that we'll be able to study their properties. These rows, the green and blue rows, are called cosets of the subgroup H. And the number of them that there are in this group, in this case it's three, is called the index in G of the subgroup H. It's basically how many copies of this subgroup do I need to partition my entire group. And for a cyclic group it's clear why we can do this, just by adding one and by adding two. By the time I add three I get back around to the original row itself. And every one of these numbers from 1 through 12, 0 through 11, is either one more than a multiple of 3, or it's two more than a multiple of 3. So it's clear why this is a partition of the group C12. And that there are three rows here means that the index of this subgroup is 3. We write for the index of the group um, G colon H inside some brackets. The index in G of the, co the, of the subgroup H is 3. So what we know is true in the cyclic case, just by virtue of this diagram, is that the 12 elements which make up the order of G can be accounted for by three rows of four elements, where those four elements come from the subgroup H. So when I multiply the order of the subgroup by the index of that subgroup, I'm going to get the number of elements. So this is something we know to be true for cyclic groups. Does this result hold for groups that are not cyclic? Might not even be abelian. Can we say for sure that something like this holds in general? 
for any finite groups? And the answer is yes, and that's the question that Lagrange's theorem testifies to. It says that regardless of whether my group is finite, or cyclic rather, as long as it's finite, we know that the order of any subgroup, H, is going to divide the order of the whole group. That this is true for cyclic groups was a simple result from number theory and divisibility. That this is also true for finite groups in general is going to require some more abstract algebra to be able to prove. And yet it's true. So this result that holds for the very specific case of cyclic groups also holds for all finite groups, regardless if they're abelian, regardless if they're cyclic. So here are our goals for this chapter. First of all, we want to start building up to this idea of cosets, the rows in this table, in the more general case, by contrasting and comparing how left and right actions of elements in any group operate on a subgroup. And we can be able to contrast that with the inner automorphisms that we talked about in the last video. In this example so far, that action of taking the subgroup H and shifting it down a row by adding one to it and adding an element of my group to it, that is an example of a left action. I'm adding one to the left of each one of these elements to get each one of those elements. Our second is going to be to define the cosets of a subgroup inside of a group. That would be the blue row and the green row. Those are cosets of the purple row H. To first define that using left and right actions of elements. So that's the most natural way I think so far to understand what they are. There's also a powerful way to define cosets using an equivalence relation. And when we can define cosets using an equivalence relation, we know by general theory of equivalence relations that the cosets of a group, of a subgroup inside of a group, will partition that group. And that's a very important tool. It's going to show me that every element of my group, regardless if it's a cyclic group or not, every element of my group is going to be in one and only one of those cosets. And that's 90% of the way towards proving that uh, the order of the coset, the order of the subgroup must divide the order of the group. The only other piece that's missing is to guarantee that every coset is going to have the same number of elements as the original subgroup. If I can prove those two things, then I will have proven Lagrange's theorem, which is to say that the order of any subgroup divides the order of the whole group. That's such a powerful theorem in the theory of finite groups that it has a number of far-reaching consequences that we want to wrap up just by identifying and proving a few of them. So this is a really important story. It's a milestone in our study of the theory of finite groups. So let's take our first step in the next video by looking at how left and right actions of elements and inner automorphisms induced by an element act upon a subgroup in a finite group.